Micromegas by Voltaire On a planet revolving around the stars Sirius, there lived a young man of great intelligence, whose acquaintance I had the honour of making during his recent visit to our little anthill. He was called Micromegas, an appropriate name for great people. He had a stature of eight leagues, or twenty-four thousand geometrical paces of five feet each, or a hundred and twenty thousand feet. We earthmen have an average stature hardly more than five feet, one pace, so Mr Micromegas's world must in turn have a circumference twenty-four thousand times greater than our little earth. Nothing in nature is simpler, more a matter of course. Given His Excellency's height, any sculptor or painter would agree his waist should, proportionally, be about fifty thousand feet around. His nose being one third the length of his handsome face, and his handsome face being one seventh the height of his handsome body, it follows that the Syrian's nose is some five thousand seven hundred and fourteen feet long. His mind rivals the most cultivated among us. He knows many things, some of which are his own inventions. He had not yet reached his 250th year, and was studying, as was customary at his age, at the most famous school on the planet. When Micromegas was about 450 years old, and already passing out of childhood, he dissected, with the aid of powerful microscopes, many little insects less than 100 feet in diameter. He wrote an interesting book about them, which got him into trouble. Those who travel only in coaches will doubtless be astonished at the sort of conveyance adopted up there, for we, on our little mound of mud, can imagine nothing beyond our own experience. Our traveller had such a marvellous acquaintance with the laws of gravitation, and all the forces of attraction and repulsion, and made such good use of his knowledge, that sometimes by means of a sunbeam, and sometimes with the help of a comet, he went from one world to another as a bird hops from bar to bar. He traversed the Milky Way in a short time, and I am obliged to confess that he never saw, beyond the stars with which it is thickly sown, that beautiful celestial Empyrean which the illustrious parson, Derham, boasts of having discovered at the end of his telescope. Not that I would for a moment suggest Mr. Derham mistook what he saw, heaven forbid! But Micromegas was on the spot. He is an accurate observer, and I have no wish to contradict anybody. Micromegas, after plenty of turns and twists, arrived at the planet Saturn. Accustomed as he was to the sight of novelties, when he saw the insignificant size of the globe and its inhabitants, he could not at first refrain from that smile of superiority which sometimes escapes even the wisest. For in truth, Saturn is scarcely nine hundred times greater than Earth, and the citizens of that country are merely dwarfs, only a thousand feet high, or thereabout. He laughed a little at first at these people, but, being a sensible fellow, the Syrian was soon convinced that a thinking being need not be altogether ridiculous, because he is only six thousand feet high. He was soon on familiar terms with the Saturnians after their astonishment had somewhat subsided. He formed a close friendship with the secretary of the Academy of Saturn, a man of great intelligence who had not indeed invented anything himself, but excelled at describing the inventions of others, and who could turn a little verse neatly enough or perform an elaborate calculation. One day, after the Syrian had laid down and the secretary had approached his face to facilitate conversation, Micromegas said, I must confess that nature is full of variety. Yes, said the Saturnian, nature is like a flower bed, the blossoms of which, oh, said the other, have done with your flower bed. She is, resumed the secretary, like an assembly of blondes and brunettes, whose attire, no, no, said the traveller, nature is like nature. Why do you search for comparisons? To please you, answered the secretary. I do not want to be pleased, rejoined the traveller. I want to be instructed. Begin by telling me how many senses the men in your world possess. We have seventy-two, said the academician, and we are always complaining that there are so few. Our imagination soars beyond our needs. We find that with our seventy-two senses, our ring, and our five moons, that our range is too restricted, and, 
in spite of all our curiosity and the tolerably large number of passions which spring out of our seventy-two senses, we often feel bored. I can well believe it, said Micromegus, for on our globe, though we have nearly a thousand senses, there lingers even in us a certain vague desire, an unaccountable restlessness, which warns us that we are of little account in the universe, and that there are beings much more perfect than ourselves. I have travelled, I have seen mortals far below us, and others greatly superior, but I have seen none who have more wants than they can satisfy. I shall some day, perhaps, reach the country where there is lack of nothing, but hitherto no one has been able to give me any positive information about it. How long do you people live? asked the Syrian. Ah, a very short time, replied the little man of Saturn. So too with us, said the Syrian. We are always complaining of the shortness of life. This must be a universal law of nature. Alas, quoth the Saturnian, none of us live more than five hundred annual revolutions of the sun. That amounts to about fifteen thousand years, according to our manner of counting. You see how it is our fate to die almost as soon as we are born. Our existence is a point, our duration an instant, our globe an atom. Scarcely have we begun to acquire little information when death arrives before we can put it to use. I myself do not venture to lay any schemes. I feel like a drop of water in a boundless ocean. I am ashamed, especially before you, of the absurd figure I make in this universe. Micromegas answered, I fear to distress you by telling you our lives are seven hundred times as long as yours but you know too well that when the time comes to give back one's body to the elements, and reanimate nature under another form, the process called death, it is precisely the same whether we have lived an eternity or only a day. I have been in countries where life is a thousand times longer than with us, and yet have heard murmurs of its brevity even there. But people of good sense exist everywhere, who know how to make the most of what they have, and to thank the author of nature. What colour is your sun when carefully examined? White deeply tinged with yellow, said the Saturnian, and when we split up one of its rays, it consists of seven colours. Our sun has a reddish light, said the Syrian, and we have thirty-nine primary colours. There is not a single sun among all those I have approached which resembles any other just as among yourselves there is not a single face which is not different from all the rest. Meanwhile, our two inquirers commenced their travels. They first jumped onto Saturn's ring, which they found pretty flat, thence they easily made their way from moon to moon. A comet passed near the last one, so they sprang upon it, along with their instruments. When they had gone about a hundred and fifty million leagues, they came across the satellites of Jupiter. They landed on Jupiter itself, and remained there a year, during which they learned some very remarkable secrets which would now be appearing in the press, were it not for certain censors who find them too hard to swallow. Leaving Jupiter, our explorers crossed a space of about 100 million leagues, and, coasting along the planet Mars, which, as is well known, is five times smaller than our own little globe, they saw two moons. These have escaped the observation of our astronomers. At last they perceived a faint glimmer. It came from our earth, and they decided to disembark. They passed over the tail of the comet, and with the aid with an aurora borealis close at hand, alighted on earth by the northern shore of the Baltic Sea, July 5th, 1737. After resting, they consumed for breakfast a couple of mountains. Then, wishing to inspect the countryside, they first went from north to south, each of the Syrian's ordinary steps was about 30,000 feet. The Saturnian dwarf, whose height was only a thousand fathoms, followed panting far behind, for he had to take twenty steps when the other made a single stride. Picture to yourself a tiny little toy spaniel pursuing a captain of the King of Prussia's grenadiers. The strangers proceeded quickly, circling the globe in 36 hours. The sun, indeed, or rather the earth, makes the same journey in a day, but it is much easier to turn on one's axis than to walk on one's feet, 
Behold, our travellers then returned to the same spot from which they had started, after having set eyes upon that sea, to them almost imperceptible, called the Mediterranean, and that other little pond which, under the name of the Great Ocean, surrounds this molehill. Therein the dwarf had never sunk much above the knee, while the other had scarcely wetted his ankle. They did all they could, searching here and there to ascertain whether earth was inhabited. They stooped, lay down, and groped about in all directions, but their eyes and hands being out of all proportion to the tiny beings who crawl up and down here, they felt not the slightest sensation which could lead them to suspect that we and our fellow creatures have the honour to exist. The dwarf hastily declared there was not a single creature on this planet. His first reason was that he had not seen one, but Micromegas politely explained that that was not a good argument. For, said he, you, with your little eyes, cannot see certain stars of the fiftieth magnitude which I distinctly discern. Do you conclude that those stars have no existence? But, argued the dwarf, this globe is so ill-constructed, so irregular, and so ridiculously shaped. All here appears chaotic. Look at these little brooks, not one of which goes in a straight line, and these ponds, which are neither round, square, oval, nor of any regular form, and all these little bristles which have rubbed the skin off my feet. He alluded to the trees. Observe, too, the shape of the globe as a whole, how it is flat at the poles, how it turns around the sun in a clumsily slanting manner, so that the polar climbs are mere wastes. In truth, what chiefly makes me think there is nobody here, is that I cannot suppose any sensible people should wish to occupy such a dwelling. Well, said Micromegas, perhaps the people who inhabit it are not sensible. But there are in fact signs of it not having been made for nothing. Everything here seems irregular, you say. But you judge by the standards of Saturn and Jupiter. Have I not told you that in the course of my travels I have always found variety? The Saturnian had answers to these arguments, and the dispute might never have ended had not he suddenly spied what seemed to him a small tadpole moving half underwater in the Baltic Sea. Actually, it was a whale. He caught it cleverly with his little finger, and placing it on his thumbnail, showed it to the Syrian, who burst out laughing a second time at the extreme minuteness of the inhabitants of our system. The Saturnian, now convinced our world was inhabited, immediately concluded that whales were the only creatures to be found here. Micromegas drew a magnifying glass from his bundle of instruments, examined the creature patiently, and found no evidence that it had a soul lodged in its body. The two travellers then suspected there were no intelligent beings in this habitation of ours, when at last they noticed something as big as a whale floating on the Baltic Sea. We know that at that very time, a flock of philosophers was returning from the polar circle where they had gone to make observations no one had attempted before. The newspapers say their vessel ran aground in the Gulf of Bothnia, and that they had great difficulty saving their lives. But we never know in this world the real truth about anything. I will relate honestly what occurred, without adding anything of my own invention a task which demands no small effort on the part of a historian. The Saturnian stretched out his hand, seized with great dexterity the ship which carried those gentlemen, and placed it in the hollow of his hand, without squeezing it too much, for fear of crushing it. Here is an animal quite different from the first, he observed. The passengers and crew, who thought a tempest had whirled them aloft, and supposed they had struck upon some kind of rock, began to stir. The sailors seized casks of wine, threw them overboard on the Saturnian's hand, then jumped down themselves, while the geometers seized their quadrants, their sectors, and a pair of Lapland girls, and descended on the Saturnian's fingers. They made such a commotion that at last he felt a tickle, a pole with an iron point being driven a foot deep into his forefinger. He surmised that this prick proceeded somehow from the little animal he was holding, but at first he perceived nothing more than minute specks spilling away from the creature. 
It was not until both Sirian and Saturnian examined the specks with microscopes that they realised the amazing truth. What pleasure Micromegas and the Dwarf felt in watching the movements of those little machines, in examining their feats, in following their operations, how they shouted with joy. I see them, they exclaimed both at once. Do you not observe how they are carrying burdens, how they stoop down and rise up? As they spoke, their hands trembled with delight at beholding objects so unusual, and with fear lest they lose them. Micromegas perceived clearly that the atoms were speaking to each other, but the dwarf refused to believe that such creatures could have any means of communicating ideas. How could those imperceptible beings have vocal organs, and what could they have to say? To be able to speak, one must think, or at least make some approach to thought, but if those creatures could think, they must have something equivalent of a soul, and to attribute the equivalent of a soul to these little animals seemed absurd. Using the equipment he had brought with him, he fabricated a pair of monster speaking trumpets like huge funnels, the narrow ends of which he and the Saturnian placed in their ears. As the wide part of the trumpets covered the ship and her crew, the faintest voice was conveyed in such a manner that the philosophers high above them clearly heard the buzzing of our insects down below. In a few hours they succeeded in distinguishing the words, and at last in understanding the language. The traveller's astonishment increased every instant. They heard mere mites speaking tolerably good sense. Such a freak of nature seemed inexplicable. You may imagine how impatiently the Syrian and his dwarf longed to converse with the atoms, but the dwarf feared that his voice of thunder, and still more that of Micromegas, might deafen the mites without conveying any meaning. To diminish its strength, they placed in their mouths little toothpicks, the tapering ends of which were brought near the ship. Then the Syrian, holding the dwarf on his knee, who in turn held the vessel with her crew upon his palm, bent his head down and spoke in a low voice, thus at last addressing them. Invisible insects, whom the hand of the Creator has been pleased to produce in the abyss of the infinitely little, I thank him for having deigned to reveal to me secrets which seemed inscrutable. It may be the courtiers of my country would not condescend to look upon you, but I despise no one, and offer you my protection. If ever anyone was astonished, it was the people who heard these words, nor could they guess whence they came. The ship's chaplain recited the prayers used in exorcism, the sailors swore, and the philosophers constructed theories. But whatever theories they constructed, they could not divine who was speaking to them. The dwarf of Saturn, who had a softer voice than Micromegas, then told them briefly with what kind of beings they were dealing. He gave an account of their journey from Saturn, and acquainted them with the parts and powers of Mr Micromegas, and, after having commiserated them for being so small, he asked if they had always been in that pitiful condition little better than annihilation, what they found to do on a globe that appeared to belong to whales, if they were happy, if they increased and multiplied, whether they had souls, and a hundred other questions. A philosopher of the party, bolder than the rest, and shocked that the existence of his soul should be questioned, took observations of the speaker with a quadrant from two different stations, and, at the third, spoke. Do you then suppose, sir, because a thousand fathoms extend between your head and feet, that you are... A thousand fathoms? cried the dwarf. Good heavens! How could he know my height? A thousand fathoms? He is not an inch out of his reckoning. What? Has that Adam actually measured me? He is a geometer. He knows my size. While I, who can barely see him except through a microscope, am still ignorant of his? Yes. I have taken your measure, said the man of science, and, based on your relative proportions, I further deduce that your big companion is approximately 120,000 feet tall. Thereupon Micromegas uttered, I see more clearly than ever that we should judge nothing by its apparent importance. The conversation grew more and more interesting, 
and Micromega spoke as follows. O oh, intelligent atoms, you must doubtless taste joys of perfect purity on your globe, for, being encumbered with so little matter, and seeming to be all spirit, you must pass your lives in love and meditation, the true life of spiritual beings. I have nowhere beheld genuine happiness, but here it is to be found, without a doubt. On hearing these words, all the philosophers shook their heads, and one, more frank than the others, candidly confessed that, with the exception of a small number held in mean estimation among them, all the rest of mankind were a multitude of fools, knaves, and miserable wretches. We have more matter than we need, said he, the cause of much evil, if evil proceeds from matter, and we have too much mind, if evil proceeds from mind. For instance, at this very moment there are a hundred thousand fools of our species who wear hats, slaying one hundred thousand fellow creatures who wear turbans, or being massacred by them, and over almost all of earth such practices have been going on from time immemorial. Ah, wretched creatures, exclaimed the Syrian with indignation. Can anyone imagine such frantic ferocity? I should like to take two or three steps and stamp upon the whole swarm of these ridiculous assassins. No need, answered the philosopher. They are working hard enough to destroy themselves, I assure you. At the end of ten years, not a hundredth part of those wretches will be left. Even if they had never drawn a sword, famine, fatigue, or intemperance will sweep them almost all away. Besides, it is not they who deserve punishment, but rather those armchair barbarians who, from the privacy of their cabinets and during the process of digestion, command the massacre of a million men and afterward ordain a solemn thanksgiving to God. The traveller, moved with compassion for the tiny human race, among whom he finds such astonishing contrasts, said to the gentleman, Since you belong to the small number of wise men, and apparently do not kill anyone for money, tell me, pray, how you occupy yourselves. We dissect flies, said the same philosopher, measure distances, calculate numbers, agree upon two or three points we understand, and dispute two or three thousand points of which we know nothing. The visitors from Sirius and Saturn immediately desired to question these intelligent atoms about the subjects on which they agreed. How far do you reckon it, said the latter, from the dog star to the great star in Gemini? They all answered together, thirty-two degrees and a half. How far do you make it from here to the moon? Sixty half diameters of the earth, in round numbers. What is the weight of your air? He thought to trick them, but they all answered that air weighs about 900 times less than an equal volume of distilled water, and 19,000 times less than pure gold. The little dwarf from Saturn, astonished at their replies, was now inclined to take for sorcerers the same people he had disbelieved, just a quarter hour ago, could possess souls. Then Micromegas said, Since you know so well what is outside yourselves, doubtless you know still better what is within you. Tell me, what is the nature of your soul, and how you form ideas? The philosophers spoke all at once as before, but this time all their opinions differed. But unluckily, a little animalcule was there in a square cap, who silenced all the other philosophical mites, saying that he knew the whole secret, that it was all to be found in the Summa of St Thomas Aquinas. He scanned the pair of celestial visitors from top to toe, and maintained that they and all their kind, their sun and stars, were made solely for man's benefit. At this speech our two travellers tumbled over each other, choking with inexhaustible laughter. Their shoulders shook and their bodies heaved up and down, till in those merry convulsions the ship the Saturnian held on his palm fell into his breeches pocket. These two good people, after a long search, recovered it at last, and duly set to rights all that had been displaced. The Saturnian once more took up the little mites, 
and Micromegas addressed them again with great kindness, though he was a little disgusted in the bottom of his heart at seeing such infinitely insignificant atoms so puffed up with pride. He promised to give them a rare book of philosophy, written in minute characters for their special use, telling all that can be known of the ultimate essence of things, and he actually gave them the volume ere his departure. It was carried to Paris and laid before the Academy of Sciences, but when the old secretary came to open it, the pages were blank. Ah, said he, just as I expected. Hi everyone, I'm Doc Sloan and I'd like to thank you for watching my science fiction station. We'd love to hear your comments and feedback on our videos. If you enjoy the content, please give it a like, and if you're a bit of a fan of science fiction, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and spread the word. Thanks very much, bye bye.